Our guest today is Sophie, who is a professional dog trainer with experience in understanding and addressing reactive behaviors in dogs. In this episode, we'll explore the challenges of dog reactivity, from identifying common triggers to effective training techniques and everything in between. So without further ado, let's jump into this topic with Sophie. Welcome to The Woofie Show, the ultimate dog lover's digest. Meet your hosts, Brian and Magda, two dog lovers ready to help you be the best dog parent, unravel the mysteries of canine behavior, and keep you updated on the latest trends in the dog world. This podcast has something for everyone. Get ready for heartwarming stories, expert advice, and a lot of laughs. So welcome to the show, Sophie. Why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background? Okay, um... I'm Sophie. Um, I have been training professionally for about four-ish years. Okay. Um, I started off volunteering with a training company here in Calgary um, and then started teaching some of their puppy classes and their basic manners classes um, and then really discovering that I really enjoyed training dogs and working with um, people and their dogs. So... um, a couple of years ago, I decided to take the leap and I went to the Victoria Stillwell Academy, um, learned all about how dogs learn um, and how to train dogs. And so now I have my VSA CDT um, with the Victoria Stillwell Academy. And um, yes, I also have a eight and a half year old border collie mix named Lila yeah you have a couple dogs hey like why don't you talk to us about those (laughs) yes so uh, my border collie mix Lila is my quote-unquote leash reactive dog okay and then I also have a two and a half year old silver lab American American Staffordshire Terrier blue tick coon hound that's an, that's an interesting mix, hey? <laughs> yes. Um, not recommended. <laughs> not recommended? <laughs> no, she's a bit of a loony. Yeah, she's a lunatic. Um, oh, lunatics are her. great, right? Yeah. It's she, good to have a loony dog sometimes. It's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. she's a challenge. Um, but you're a trainer, so I guess that's a good thing, right? You want is. to have that challenging dog that you can work with and like really be proud of it at the end. Be like, oh, oh I did this, right? 100%. It it's it's really she's really helped me grow as a trainer yeah. in um, my level of patience. Mm. That's for sure, and how I need to really look outside of the box to to do things a little differently to set her up to succeed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, very different than my chill border collie who's super easygoing. Oh really? Um, border collies don't seem to be that chill. No, and it's <laughs> weird because she's too easygoing. And that's then, awesome. Yeah, having Chessie was just like the complete opposite. Yeah. Easygoing. So that's awesome. So any other dogs? You just have three, right? Uh, two, just two, the two, just the two, just Chessie and Lila. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I that's, that's enough for me. That's enough. I <laughs> don't think I will ever have more than two. <laughs> that's great. So today's episode is obviously about reactivity. Mm-hmm. So we're going to be talking about in a broad sense of what reactivity actually is. So why don't you kind of explain to the listeners that might not know what is reactivity? Okay, Um, so typically reactivity would be those barky, lungy, growly type behaviors in response to some sort of change in the environment or a trigger that comes into the environment. Okay. Um, And your dog may be reactive in a certain environment and not reactive in another environment. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So how does it manifest really? So you're saying is the... the growling and the lunging is there any other way that the reactivity could manifest and how is it different to aggressiveness is it the same thing that's a very good question (laughs) um you can think about it a little bit if you like yeah it's it's how is like aggression different to a dog that's reactive i wonder if it's the same thing or is no, it different? I feel like aggression comes from, like true aggression comes from a different place than reactivity comes from. Much of the time, a reactive dog or a dog that's behaving in a reactive way comes from some sort of nervousness. They're scared about something, mm-hmm. they're worried about something. And those behaviors of barking and lunging have 
cause that trigger, that thing they're worried about to go away previously. So they're going to keep doing those behaviors to keep that trigger away. Um, whereas aggressiveness, it it's not always something they're nervous about. Sometimes they're outwardly aggressive towards something, um, not for the reason of being nervous. Uh, it just comes from a, a different place, and there can be different reasons why dogs are aggressive versus reactive. Um, like you could have a reactive dog that would never ever bite anybody, yeah, just might growl and lunge, uh, versus you could have an aggressive dog that will bark and lunge but also potentially bite someone. Okay, there so the be a bit so of a the aggression seems to me like it's that next step yeah you're in not activity maybe yeah 100 <laughs> yeah, a reactive dog doesn't necessarily mean they're going to bite somebody there's always a possibility yeah um but it's that reactiveness often comes from um emotion inside that's triggering that behavior to happen and aggressiveness can sometimes be from not necessarily the dog feeling something specific um and it can be a genetic problem aggressiveness can be a genetic problem oh okay um, something that there's not really much thought that's going on in the brain whereas there's reactivity there's some sort of thought there's some sort of reason why they're behaving that way rather than just behaving yeah there's like a so it's reason why action driven rather than like a mental stimuli that happens yeah. behind it yeah so like yeah more of the reactivity has more of an explanation sometimes than, yeah. than outright aggression does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's a really good answer. Thank you. <laughs> well, also, I was like, whoa. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, it's very, like, thought-provoking, right? It's mm -hmm. like you have to think about it to really understand it. And sometimes I feel like people see a reactive dog and instantly assume, oh, that dog is aggressive. Yeah. Which is not true. No. They're just reacting to something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to, like, bite the head off right <laughs> yeah 100 and even a dog that reacts in a said and said one environment they may not be reactive in another yeah. environment like as well so it's, yeah. yeah it doesn't mean they're horrible just because yeah. they're behaving in that sort of way. so why do some dogs show reactive behaviors specifically is it we kind of touched upon it already saying that uh, in some instances it's kind of genetic of how the dog was bred maybe that's how it was passed on mm -hmm. uh, that reactive behavior uh, a little bit like maybe you know if someone has trauma about something that can be passed on right or is it something that is kind of the way that dog was brought up so it's both <laughs> it can be both yeah um it can be both it can be either it's kind of this gray area, area. Um, so as we said, with genetics can play uh, a part in, um, why a dog may become reactive. Um, when puppies are inside their mother's womb, if their mom goes through, um, a lot of stressful experiences that can sometimes cause, um, a stressful environment for the puppies, um, which can cause some behavioral concerns when they do grow up. So even in utero, some stress in utero can cause wow so it happens that early like the it dog can, can yeah. literally be set for life it's, of having I mean, these problems it's it's not like it's not guaranteed that they're yeah. going to have these problems but it can play a part and gen genetics can play a part um also if their mom or their dad is has some reactive behaviors or suffers from resource guarding or something like that that can be passed on to the puppies as well um environment as well as you said mm -hmm. um the how they are raised can also uh play a part in reactivity um their socialization yeah can play a part in reactivity as well um now that can be if they've never experienced and never had much socialization that can cause reactivity later on in life because they're not used to different things so they're yeah. not sure how to behave around different triggers can um, reactivity kind of show up later on in life so even though your dog has been an angel for about you know five years of their life and then suddenly something happens and they suddenly just start acting like they're losing their mind over something right mm -hmm. I, is that possible it's definitely possible that's, yes. that's crazy. Um, and maybe that wouldn't be so genetically inclined, mm. but maybe something maybe something happened while you were out on a walk and some maybe a dog ran up to you with your dog on a leash and started 
um, going at your dog and biting at your dog, and now your dog's afraid of other dogs. One hundred percent, something can happen when they're when they're older, and then suddenly they are presenting all these behaviors that they didn't have before. Yeah, um, medical issues can also create reactivity. Wow, if your dog's not feeling well. Um, and that does happen sometimes with older dogs when you start having like the old dog problems and, you know, the arthritis and. Do they um, like become a bit grumpy, right? Yeah, <laughs> right? Like you're like, well, you never growled at that. You've never done that before. I yeah. wonder why you're feeling this way. 100% sometimes um, medical issues can also yeah in those reactive behaviors as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are you able to talk to us a little bit about common triggers? Um, what, what are the common things that trigger dogs' reactivity, for instance? So one of the bi- normal ones are dogs. Is typically, yeah. um, dog reactivity is one of the bigger um, types of reactivity that I see. Um, people as well, um, people coming into the environment. Um, that can be seeing people outside on a walk or people coming into the house as well. That can be a trigger. Um Things in the environment like cars, uh, yeah. and this is a big thing: cars and things that move for herding dogs. Yeah, um, that's a big thing. Uh, you often get um, like collies, Aussies, um, shepherds that can have those barking, lungy behaviors to things that move really quickly. Yeah, because um, they have that instinct, right, to herd it yeah, back in, kind yeah, of thing. One hundred percent. So that can be. Um, Would you say like trigger. pretty much anything can be a trigger in reality? Yeah, what, <laughs> pretty much anything. Literally anything could be a trigger. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Yeah. So, are there? So this might be a bit of a weird question, but are there any specific breeds that would show more reactive behaviors? than others like are there dogs that are you know purely calm and you can be kind of safe that they're not going to display any reactivity uh, issues and there are dogs that are like oh yeah these dogs are inherently reactive so I wouldn't I'd say that any any dog any breed is susceptible to um displaying reactive behaviors again as we said with the Genetics possibly paying a part, um, the environment, the how their type of socialization. It's any breed could potentially have um, and suffer from some reactive behaviors. But the breeds like the guardian dog breeds, kind of like the Canny Corso type breeds mm-hmm. or um, the Great Pyrenees, ones that are bred to protect um, their people, protect livestock – like they, those type of dogs are more likely to not be as friendly towards people. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to bark, lunge, and growl at other people, but it's more likely they have more of that genetic perception to not enjoy random people's presence yeah. as much as um, maybe like a lab or a golden retriever. Yeah. Bird, just because that's what they're bred for. That's the purpose that yeah they, they have for us that's very interesting because i feel like a lot of the time when people do get a dog they don't really read into it so much mm-hmm. they're like oh i'm gonna get a king corso because i just love that breed mm-hmm. and they don't realize that there's a lot of work that needs to actually be put into that dog for that dog to be a family dog right yeah and and i mean you can't always guarantee that 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 dog's gonna be okay with people coming over yeah as well because as we said like it's a just genetic thing it's they're bred to be protective of their humans yeah. it's so. like you can't be angry at it right no it's like that's what you that's what the dogs are <laughs> exactly. for yeah <laughs> yeah yeah 100 percent. the same as a border collie that's nipping and i'm like okay yes this does it's make just sense. a normal thing right <laughs> like they were literally bred to do that you can't mm-hmm. be angry at the dog mm-hmm. so are you able to maybe share with us an experience of where you had a reactive dog and how you were successfully able to maybe turn that behavior around or maybe mitigate it somehow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually a lot of my clients um, do have dogs that um, suffer from reactive behaviors. It seems to be something that we're seeing more and more of, especially since COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of my most recent clients, little B, um, little B. <laughs> yeah, his name is B. He's lovely. Um, he's a little. What is he? He's a little Chihuahua pap- uh, papillon. 
think. Pa- papillon? 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 Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, he's a sweet little uh, black fluffy guy. Yeah. Um, And he was having, exhibiting a lot of um, barky, growly, lungy behaviors towards um, people inside the home when he was out on walks outside the home um, and to people and dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, so much so that his human uh, was really, really stressed about taking him outside. Going outside was no longer fun or enjoyable um, for either of them. Yeah. So. That's that's kind of... Um, I see that a lot in chihuahuas, actually. Chihuahuas yeah. are these little guys that are just, like, out there to get you in the world. <laughs> They're, like, the smallest dog, but so loud. Very and you loud. see that a lot. And I wonder whether it's because the owners don't actually take the time to train that dog the same way that they would train a lab, for instance, or a bigger dog because they treat it as a toy, right? A a toy dog Mm -hmm. in a weird sense. I wonder if that's part of the issue. It definitely could be because in a way, um, with a small dog, you can't, like there's no chance of your small dog pulling you over. Yeah. Um, there's a lot lower um, safety risk mm-hmm. with a smaller dog. Yeah. So, and it's super easy to just scoop them up if yeah. they're like, hey, I don't like what you're doing. I'm just going to scoop you yeah. up. Um, so but it is a lot really, easier. Yeah, it's, it's a lot really easier to manage. Problem. Yeah. No, it's a lot easier to manage their behaviors. Yeah. And it's even if they were to bite someone, it could it would be a smaller injury yeah. if there was an injury. Um, so, I mean, and it is possible that people do, don't take smaller dogs' um, concerns seriously yeah. because they're small dogs. They're kind of like, which is unfair too because yeah. it doesn't matter how what size of the dog is, you still should be um, responding appropriately to them communicating that yeah. I don't like this or something's wrong. Yeah. Um, so... The training yeah. should be kind of the same, even though the risk is lower, right? Yeah, it still should be taken just as seriously because that dog's still having a really hard time and mm. they're communicating they're having a hard time. Yeah. Um, but um, B, like, they're actually really amazing. They, um, she 100% was like, yeah, it's time to, to get some assistance. Yeah. And so we... And with the react reactivity towards dogs and people, um, we started working on mostly the people first because I feel like it's way harder when you have a reactive dog that's reactive to both people and dogs. Anywhere when you go outside, there's usually a person yeah. or a person you and a dog. You just can't avoid it. No. Unle- unless you go on Monday morning like I have. This uh, like, yeah, like <laughs> 6 a.m. Like no one there, but still there is but, a chance. Yeah, 100%. So we started working on the the people first. Um, and we've, they've come so far. Like we started um, working under threshold where we could find a good um threshold for B where he wasn't barking Mm -hmm. um, and lunging at people so that was about excuse me about at the 40 45 foot distance where he could look at the person and um, we would mark and reward for that good behavior of Mm -hmm. looking at the person and looking at the person without barking or lunging towards the person so we'd started that distance and then we slowly kind of closed in the distance. Um, and I actually just saw her a couple of days ago for our last session. And we are literally walking past people on the same pathway. And he is so much calmer. He's not barking. He's not reacting. He's just like checking out the person and then looking back up at his human. Like, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm confident. And they've come so far. She's, she's really enjoying um, walks again. She is a lot less stressed out on walks now yeah um so it's and even with dogs is a is a huge improvement as well so um on that same walk we were able to walk um right beside a dog um that was probably about three feet away from us um we did have to use a little bit of management there because i'm like i think the dog's too close i think b's still gonna go a little bit over threshold so we had to use um, our find it cue, which is it's kind of like trying to find that good balance, balance right? exactly right. Because if he's too over threshold and he's barking and screaming, yeah. he's not learning. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, finding that threshold um, of where our dogs can learn is really important. But. So that's interesting. So you're saying that like forty feet—that's quite far away, hey? Mm-hmm. And I feel like a lot of people take it 
too close, too quick. One hundred percent. And it's just like, why is this not working? That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. Is it? Yeah. They. That's one hundred percent. It's like you it. are literally. You need more patience. I think. Yeah. <laughs> right? More patience. More distance. Yeah. Listen to your dog. Yeah. Listen to what they're telling you that they need. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So, what kind of recommendations do you have for pet parents to maybe prevent completely? reactivity from a young age or maybe um try to minimize their activity on like by themselves rather than using the trainer Mm -hmm. so to prevent reactivity ways that you could do that if you were starting completely from scratch um you're thinking about getting a puppy finding um, a reputable and responsible breeder if you are looking for a specific breed or specific breed mix um, that would be a good start because mm-hmm. um, as we talked about genetics being uh, playing a part in yeah. um, reactivity, if you know you are getting a puppy from um, a reputable breeder that um, does um, proper physical and um, mental health testing on their um, dams and sires to make sure that they are producing physically and mentally sound dogs, that would be a really good step. Step two is so the prime socialization period for a puppy occurs between about eight weeks to 12 to 16 weeks, depending on the puppy. Yeah. So during that time, our puppies are like sponges. Um, Everything that they're experiencing, they're just going to soak up. And that's going to be kind of like the imprint and the basis for Mm -hmm. the rest of their life. So it's this not is, a, it's not a long time. It's right? really not a long time, yeah. especially when a lot of the time you you should be you should not be getting your puppy before the age of eight weeks, um, which that should be fine if you've gotten it from a responsible breeder. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you really don't have a whole huge um, a window of time to um, I- expose your dog and mm-hmm. socialize your puppy, um, especially because we're also fighting the aspect of doing it in a safe manner with um proper injections and vaccines and things like that as well um so the the good thing is is that we're kind of learning there's lots of different ways that we can mitigate the safety factors of having a not fully vaccinated puppy um you can get a little pouch or a backpack that you can put your puppy in um, to take them out into to different places, um, even just walking around your neighborhood with your puppy in your little pouch. Um, and, you know, people come and walk by. You could feed them a couple of cookies yeah. or maybe give them a couple of pets. Um, just creating, really focusing on creating positive associations with things in the environment. Um some people have like little trolleys as well yeah, that they push strollers, around. Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Whatever you can do to make sure your puppy is safe, but also get out with them is yeah. really important. Um, and as I said, exposing them in that positive way um, and ensuring that they're enjoying themselves—that's really the big thing. Because um, sometimes we can put our puppies in environments where they're actually not enjoying themselves. Um, and it really does depend on the puppy because we have Mm -hmm. some puppies that are like, yes, I want to be in the middle of everything. I want (laughs) to say hi to everybody. I absolutely love this. Touch me, touch me, touch me. And then we have other puppies that are a bit more reserved and maybe would like to meet one person at a time or maybe meet one dog at a time. Um, and then sometimes we may accidentally not read their body language or not understand what they're saying and then put them in the middle of a dog park. Mm, Um, and then you have... That's another way that reactivity can happen yeah. if we're not understanding what our puppies are telling us and they're overwhelmed and they feel unsafe in the yeah. environment that they're in. So focusing on that positive, proactive socialization where our puppy is having fun um, or at least neutral to the mm-hmm. stimulus. Um, that's kind of what we're going to be looking at to set them up for the rest of their life. And that doesn't mean we can't change things later on. It, it just makes it a little bit more difficult if there was a poor association with something to change it later on. One thing that with the puppy classes that I was teaching, we would um, separate the puppies into different um, little groups. Like we'd have puppies that were really exuberant and really wanted yeah. to play with one another. So there's so a they mix, they would stay right? together. Yeah. yeah, and then the puppies that were shyer would go together. So when we're, we're not having the exuberant puppy yeah. come up on the shy puppy and scare the shy puppy, yeah. right? Those positive, just creating those positive experiences really is the the big thing um, to 
yeah, hopefully prevent them from being afraid of dogs in the future or apprehensive about dogs in the future. Yeah, but it's just interesting how there's different training methods in terms of um, and how so early on dogs can just absorb all of these experiences and how it affects them later on in life. 100%. Um, And I feel like there's a lot of misconception with the socialization period I think a lot of people think that you know the first year is is the all the time that you have which it, it's still it just even if you pass the socialization period or you do or you get your puppy at 20 weeks of age that doesn't mean you've you have no hope mm-hmm. continue those positive um, interactions and that proactive positive socialization um, it's just if you have that opportunity with a young puppy between 8 to 16 weeks, we want to be taking advantage of that as best as we can and use that time that we have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what would you recommend to someone that, for instance, says, you know, I got a puppy, but I still have to go to work. I don't have time to socialize this puppy. What would you say to that? Because that's a common we, thing. We can, we can make time. Yeah. Yeah. If... If someone was like, yeah, I, you know, I have to work and they're coming to me and they're asking me, what can I do? Like, what can I do here? I feel like I don't have time. We would make a plan. We'd be able to make time to go on a quick outing or spend some time outside. It doesn't have to be, um, it's more about that quality, not necessarily quantity. Mm -hmm. We don't have to meet um, like a hundred people in a week. Yeah. We just got to make sure that, you know, your puppy meets a couple of people and they enjoy themselves. Yeah. Good things happen. Um, and maybe, um, like I have a checklist for people with, um, young little puppies, a little socialization checklist. Um, and I provide them with that and be like, if you can maybe try to get, you know, one thing, one thing done from this cluster, maybe meet a person that's in a wheelchair in for this week for meeting, meeting the people. And then maybe we'll see if we can meet, um, a large dog that you, that you trust and Mm. you know, that's fully vaccinated and his puppy safe. Um, just a few different, like there's different categories of people, dogs, um, maybe rollerblades, objects. Yeah. Um, different brushes, toothbrushes, uh, brushes for their hair, just kind of trying different things um, throughout the week. So your puppy can be slowly exposed to different things, have those good experiences, but aren't overwhelmed with too many new things all at once. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah there's, there's always time. There's, there's always, always time. time. <laughs> yeah. So like, <laughs> even if it's 10 minutes, at least it's something. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 So, okay, we got a puppy. Now we've got up to 16 weeks mm-hmm. to socialize it prime time but it doesn't stop there no right? definitely not <laughs> no so um w- what would you say um are like the next steps after that prime time would it be just to continue working on that dog and continue exposing it even though some people think oh, 16 weeks have passed and now what do I do? <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, no, you're going to be doing all the same things that you were doing before. Um, just maybe think about, do I, so I guess there could be a little bit of a change in the sense of, okay, we've, we've made a good imprint. We've had a solid amount of interactions with yeah. all of these different things. And I feel like my puppy's pretty comfortable um, with these different um, things in the environment. So now maybe we're going to be working on a little bit more of um, more of like our behavioral cues, more of kind of check in with me and look to me when something happens mm-hmm. in the environment or something changes. And maybe then we'll work a little bit more on loose leash walking and yeah. maybe focus out in this big environment where yeah. all these cool things are happening. So it's kind of like building on the foundations that you already built up to that 16th week, right? Yeah, like still continuing to expose your dog, um, but then also teaching your dog exactly what what I want you to do when this thing comes into mm-hmm. the environment. Um and something that will sometimes help prevent um, excitement reactivity mm-hmm. is kind of changing your aspect of instead of seeing all the different people and getting up and close and personal with the people or the dogs, if you're choosing to have your puppy say hi to 
dogs on walk, which is, I don't recommend um, <laughs> random dogs. I'm having your puppy meet random yeah. dogs on a walk. Cause you just don't know. You don't know if they're puppy safe. Yeah. A lot of dogs don't tolerate puppies very well. So that was um, actually my next question. Okay. <laughs> but I'll let you finish the point that you were making. Um, so thinking about maybe what do I want my dog to do when another dog comes into the environment or a person comes into the environment and is walking towards us? Do I want my dog to go and say hello to that person? Mm-hmm. Or do I want my dog to just kind of hang out beside me or maybe sniff the grass or just like completely ignore that person? Yeah. Um, thinking about what you do want your puppy to be doing once they become an adult dog. So building on, on that, a lot of dog owners kind of struggle with balancing what is a good amount of interaction Mm -hmm. with other people and dogs and when should they say no right Mm -hmm. like to me when I was puppy training my dog I found it really rude when people would just scream at her being like puppy right (laughs) and keep running at her Mm -hmm. and like trying to touch her and all this and I'm like don't do that. I'm trying to teach my dog to be neutral to the mm-hmm. environment that she's in so that she's happy and content. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, what would you say is the right amount? Is is this such thing? <laughs> um, I think it depends with, it depends on the puppy, really. Yeah. Um, I don't think, uh, yeah, I wouldn't think of it as like a set amount of people or a set amount yeah. of dogs your puppy has to meet. Um, it's about the quality of, yeah. of that interaction and how your dog is feeling about that interaction. Um, yeah, don't, it's, it's more about them seeing a whole like wide array of people wearing different things or mm-hmm. like I said, people, a person in a wheelchair, a person on crutches, person in a Halloween costume, a person yeah. in a hat, um just yeah more about that that quality rather than the amount there's no set amount that you need to um need your puppy to meet but I would also suggest that you don't meet every person that you walk by like as you said like yeah we want our dogs to be kind of I want them to be fine that like cool a person's walking by us awesome but that doesn't mean we're gonna go see that person it's just yeah it's that that neutral kind of behavior like I'm okay if that person comes near us and walks by us but I'm not gonna kind of get so overly excited and exuberant Mm. and I need to see that person so that balance between some people we say hi to some people we don't say hi to uh that kind of balance between the both yeah yeah so that kind of nicely leads us into the next question of what would you recommend that dog parents don't do okay when they're trying to work on their reactivity or like maybe prevent the reactivity from happening altogether right Mm -hmm. so for preventing reactivity from happening um i'd highly suggest that you don't meet um unknown dogs when you are like on a leash walk mm-hmm. with your dog um now why is that yeah there's a few <laughs> reasons for that um so the first one is um when dogs are on a leash we take away their ability to flight mm-hmm. to leave so they're on this leash and then um another dog's walking towards us which as as we know if we've seen dogs like at an off-leash area it's not normal for dogs to go head on towards yeah. one another. That's already considered to be somewhat of a threatening behavior. Mm-hmm. So kind of intimidating. Yeah, 100%. So we have two dogs walking completely towards one another on a leash. Mm-hmm. And then often they start with a nose to nose greeting when they're leashed, which is not a normal dog behavior. If they were off leash, they would yeah. curve around and they'd sniff one another's bums. Mm-hmm. And then they'd move into maybe a quick face sniff yeah so we're starting with that face on face um and often a lot of dog owners have their leash very tense and very tight so now we have a face on face greeting with a random dog that we don't know and our leashes are tight that is going to create the opportunity for there to be some sort of explosion um when the leashes are tight like that and taut the dog doesn't have the ability to 
move away mm -hmm. and even being on a leash they don't really have as much it's of an like ability to move away we take away their ability to almost communicate with you right Pro yeah we just properly kind of and the other dog the behavior yeah. to happen mm -hmm. this meat that's completely unnatural yeah um so yeah yeah so um it's it's more likely that something's going to happen when two dogs meet nose to nose on a leash we mm -hmm. take away that ability to move away if they decide i don't like this dog they can't move away because we're stuck on a leash. Yeah. So that pushes them into most likely the fight option. So now we have two dogs at the end of the leashes mm. going at one another, yeah. which is not ideal. No. Um, because now we've created a poor experience. So now we may have a reactive dog in the future. Yeah. Um, another reason I don't do uh, meat on leash, um, random dogs, is also because we may have the complete opposite when the dogs are really excited and now all the dogs are jumping yeah. around playing and now we have a whole bunch of entanglements of yeah. leashes and now we're running around trying to collect the leash and it could potentially put the human in a bad position if they have to bend over and try and yeah. get in between because even though she, the dogs are enjoying themselves they might still nip at you right? yeah exactly. and like, you, could, you could get bit <laughs> yeah you could um and again if the dogs were playing initially and then they decide no i don't like this now they're all entangled in yeah. one another and now we have a different problem that, entrapment where yeah. they can't move right yeah <laughs> um so so that's yeah, one that's, thing that you shouldn't reason. do <laughs> yes and the last reason why i don't recommend um meeting unknown dogs while leashed is one again we don't really know mm -hmm. the dog um we don't know how the dogs other dogs are going to behave um and if you do that if every time you see a dog in the environment we go and see that dog you're setting a precedent for your dog and your dog will think, well, every time there's a dog in the environment, I go and see that dog. So yeah. I'm going to go and see that yeah. dog. Ooh, I'm excited. I'm going to go see that dog. Yeah. It's great. It's good. I'm making friends. And then maybe like one day the, you don't want that yeah, the to 15th happen. time yeah. you're like, no, we can't see that dog. And now your dog's going to be like, exactly. Like, why like, not? Why can't I go and <laughs> see that dog? And then maybe you have a dog that's screaming and lunging at the end of the leash because yeah. they're frustrated because all the other times I got to see that dog but yeah. now I don't get to see that dog yeah yeah so and then you can create reactivity because the because I way. see it all the time like you know me and Maple will go out for a walk and you know if the dog is far enough away uh we are fine to just walk past you know as normal and she's completely calm you know mm -hmm. having the best time and then the other dog that's walking the opposite direction they are just you know going at it barking wanting to come and meet her and all this and mm -hmm. that and the owners they just go why why are you behaving like this mm -hmm. <laughs> they just talk to this dog and they not really fixing the behavior mm -hmm. it's more like they just stop barking stop yeah. it yeah like mm. don't behave like this and it's like your dog can't understand what you're saying no child, no <laughs> <laughs> it's like you saying those things to your dog will not fix this behavior no and yeah. i just want to say like you need to work with this dog you need to make it seem like you you are more interesting mm -hmm. than my dog being yeah. walked by me mm -hmm. so it's it's just crazy it is yeah so what would you recommend uh once again, that dog parents do in that situation when they have that dog that's just really excited to come and see other dog. How would you say, oh, this is what you need to do instead? Don't just say, don't do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would say maybe evaluate, evaluate the scenario. Um, like, as you said, some you see the, the people that's like, no, stop barking. Yeah. No. And then the dog's just barking at the end of the leash. You're like, okay. Like think about, think about I what's worse for them. I'm yeah. like, <laughs> really? Like you talking to your dog, like it's a human baby yeah. or something. Yeah. Even though a human baby wouldn't be able to understand what you're saying either. No, so why do you expect the dog to? <laughs> 100%. And it's funny because it's, it's a bit of human nature as well, because mm -hmm. we are such verbal creatures. Yeah. So a lot of people assume that our dogs 100% understand what we're saying and they don't speak English at all. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but really evaluate okay, what have I done so far and has it worked? Mm -hmm. And really think about that. Has it worked? Is what I'm doing working? If it's not, we have to change something. Yeah. Um. So how we spoke about, even the, you said when um, you and Maple are at a, a fair enough distance, we can walk by, there's no issue. So yeah. finding that distance for their dog where 
they can just observe the dog and be like, okay, cool. There's a dog in the environment. And then we need to do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we can redirect towards our human, turn towards our human, get rewarded for looking towards our human. Um, maybe we can um, throw a find it and you can sniff in the ground mm-hmm. while the dog goes by. If you're like, yep, no, this dog is going to be way too close. I'm just going to get you to sniff in the ground for some cookies. And then that dog can walk by. Um, that's Would more of a management that you just completely turn away from the situation. Yeah, you like could do that too. Literally, just go across the road, just turn away. Try yep, one hundred percent. That's yeah. an option as well. Um, turning around, going back the other way you came, crossing the road, getting more distance if you need it. Um, it's yeah, it's a lot about preparing yourself for those situations. Mm-hmm. Like we train for the scenario we train for real life yeah um and then preparing what you're going to do and then putting it into into place when you're in those real life scenarios so 100 percent you turning is an option um getting distance whenever you can um and if you can't get that distance and you're already within that realm of your dog's barking and lunging sometimes if you can't get away Sometimes you just got to hold your leash and make sure that, you know, you're keeping everybody safe. You're keeping yeah. the other dog safe. You're keeping yourself safe and you're keeping your dog safe. And then you wait until the trigger's passed and you move on. Sometimes, unfortunately, if you are working with a reactive dog, sometimes that does happen. Yeah. Unfortunately. That's mm-hmm. crazy. If you so can redirect them into something else. How do you feel about dog parks? Um, so... <laughs> that's a very broad question it's very broad yeah it's a great question I like it what are your general kind of feelings about it general feelings are I'd probably avoid for the most part Mm -hmm. um mostly the places that you would think of like in Calgary like um like the fenced in like bonus off leash park anything that's fenced in I probably would avoid Sue Higgins I mean, River Park isn't fenced in, but it's a very busy dog park mm-hmm. where you get a lot of different dogs, um, different um, personalities. You have no control of who's attending the dog park. Mm-hmm. Um, it's when they're in that area where there's a lot of busyness, there's mm-hmm. no time for your dog to kind of like decompress and come down from meeting an unknown dog. Yeah. Um, and often people just stand in the same area and then their dogs just kind of like run around in loops and one's humping one another and, <laughs> and then one's laying down and one's just laying on top. Like there's just so much happening yeah. and there's so much, much stimulation right? yeah. that it's just a breeding ground for poor behaviors or dogs to get injured. Um, I do love the fact that we have so many off-leash areas within the city of Calgary. I 100% use off-leash areas. Um, but I go at times like during the week, early morning is Mm -hmm. when I usually use an off-leash area. I don't go to an off-leash area to meet other dogs. I go to let my dogs run, sniff, dig, do their doggy things. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of why I use off-leash areas um, and that's how I use them. I generally would avoid most off-leash areas on weekends and holidays. Yeah. (laughs) That's my general consensus. It's funny because if you give that advice out there, no one will be there on weekends. No. (laughs) They'll be like, okay, we're going, it's a weekend. So everyone stays at home. (laughs) And the reason why that is too is because if you go on the weekend, you're likely probably going to come across the people that you know, we work, that's fine. They but if worked all week and they haven't done anything, yeah, <laughs> anything with their dog all week. And then it's like day five of pent yeah. up energy and just explosion. Yeah. Yeah. And then they wonder why another dog is like biting or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. It's because they have so much energy pent up over the week. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I avoid it dog can. parks. I'm like scared of it. <laughs> Whoa, good. That's a good thing. <laughs> it's good because so much can happen there and you can ha- you can get a reactivity can start happening in your dog yeah. if you are, if something poor happens at one of those dog parks. And even unintentionally, like if you bring a very shy dog to a, a dog park mm-hmm. and then a really exuberant dog's just like, yes, let's play with me and is jumping on this dog. And they're like, oh my gosh, please yeah, no. Get away from yeah. me. Yeah. And now they're like, I don't like dogs. Please don't bring me here again. Don't get me near any other yeah, dogs. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. I have lost um, my way here <laughs> of what we're talking about. Okay. So we have a another thought provoking 
okay. quote. <laughs> so what would you say about the statement that there's no bad dogs, only bad owners? Do you um, agree with it? Do you disagree with it? What's your kind of general take on this? I wouldn't say I agree or disagree. Okay. I, um, I mean, I do kind of agree to a certain extent. Um, but as we did talk about that genetics play a part in mm -hmm. our dog's behavior. Um, when we're getting a certain, a specific breed, we need to expect that that breed's probably going to present general breed specific behaviors mm -hmm. um so yes having a poor owner that um isn't providing their dog proper stimulation proper physical and mental stimulation um or providing any sort of training or being very punitive and um creating a, their dog to be scared of them yeah there can sometimes be not great owners and not great humans um, treating their dog very well. But sometimes it has nothing to do with the human. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can just be just like us. We have genetics that make us a certain way. Um, and some of those things we can't change. Yeah. Like I can't change my eye color. Yeah. Well, I can, <laughs> I guess, put a contact in, but that would not be changing my true eye color. There's certain things about a dog that we can't necessarily change if they are breed traits. Mm -hmm. We can work towards um, changing and teaching alternate behaviors um, and setting them up to succeed in certain ways, but there's still that innate behavior inside them if it's a kind of a natural breed trait right yeah so, so for instance if if your dog has that trait inside of them and that instinct that doesn't necessarily mean that they are doomed for life no it doesn't you can it still doesn't. work with it 100 percent. Right? if yeah. you are a responsible owner <laughs> but i do wonder if the problem ultimately starts with people breeding these type of dogs mm -hmm. regardless so in a weird sense it goes back to bad humans this is true because mm -hmm. they're the ones who actually bred those dogs that is very true if you Good never point. bred these dogs there wouldn't be this problem that's very if true there was no backstreet humans. like backyard breeders or mm -hmm. whatever they called or puppy mills right yeah. if we kind of put stop to that maybe there wouldn't be as many issues 100 percent. i can fully <laughs> agree with you 100 percent. so yeah that's kind of like my take on this mm -hmm. and it's it's hard sometimes to put that across because a lot of people as you said go into like the genetic part of it but i'm just like right but let's go back to the source mm -hmm. right of where where did that come from but then again there are things like accidental pregnancies and things like that too whoa 100 percent. <laughs> like that does that happen. happen yeah 100 which is understandable right sometimes yeah sometimes it happens and you can't prevent it you gotta do something with these puppies yeah, so exactly that does happen but yeah um, so are there any tools or equipment that you would recommend for managing and training reactive dogs? Yeah, so um, usually my go-to for equipment that I use for with a lot of my reactive dog clients, and it, it depends because sometimes we just work on a flat collar, um, but I also recommend um, a Y front harness or a body harness as well. Um, because if, if, my dog is or the dog I'm working with is lunging barking growling at things I want to make sure that we have proper physical control over the dog mm -hmm. so I personally find that a dog wearing a body harness I have more physical control over than a dog wearing just a flat collar personally mm -hmm. um so that's one thing that I would recommend um I also usually do recommend having a longer leash than just like a standard six foot leash um, because sometimes giving our dog a little bit more line can ease their um, nervousness a little bit because they're not so stuck, especially with the dog that's very afraid of a trigger. And they're like, I can't get away. I'm on this leash. <laughs> giving them a little bit more line can give them a little bit ch more chance of kind of movement yeah. um, to be able to give them a little bit more agency about 
their ability to be like, you can still move away. We can get that distance. I'll encourage you to come a little further back here rather than being like, I'm stuck. Oh my God, here it is. I better lunge and bark <laughs> type thing. Would you recommend um, flexi leashes? Or one of those extendable ones that not, go on forever. <laughs> not for not for a reactive dog. If you yeah. are working through reactivity, um, gonna say no um, because if your dog's out on like thirty foot down the flexi mm. lead and then you're walking around a corner, your dog's way ahead of you. You can't. You see don't what's know happening. what's around that yeah. corner, right? <laughs> um, so. That's there's a, no. a time no <laughs> generally no but there's a time and a place like yeah. you could do a flexi lead on in like an open green space where no one else is there with mm. your dog on a harness and a flexi lead yeah. okay yeah, yeah that's fair depends on the scenario yeah it depends on the scenario um it's like but, you gotta have some common sense here <laughs> yes um with longer leads i definitely would recommend like a long line like a long 20 to 50 foot line rather than an actual flexi lead i feel like you have more physical control over your dog with a long line versus a flexi lead if you if you need to wheel your dog in quickly um you can easily run down that flexi or that uh, long line sorry mm -hmm. but with a flexi lead you're gonna be doing this yeah. weird like <laughs> button pushing thing and you have to pull your dog back and it just would be a little bit of a mess yeah no so. i just uh, i find these leashes quite funny yeah. actually yeah there was an incident once when we were crossing the road and this woman it was in Canmore actually so you know super populated mm -hmm. people walking everywhere and she had these two big dogs like labradoodle or something on a flexi like just kind of hanging off her belt and this dog could just go wow. anywhere and I'm like get your dog away from me oh my. <laughs> this dog can just run around anywhere and like meet everyone oh I'm like goodness. I don't want to meet your dog no. this giant dog is just like coming at me oh crossing the road i'm like what is happening <laughs> oh my goodness that is madness yeah <laughs> that's just asking then, for something I'm, to happen yeah i'm like I, I hate these leashes like why would someone do that <laughs> oh my god and again people have bad no humans <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's definitely not the time to be using a, a longer type leash or a flexi leash when yeah, there's that so just I, dense population. I genuinely screamed at her, which is totally not like me. I'm normally pretty calm and collected. But that time I was literally trying to just keep... Uh, we were actually dog sitting. So I had a couple dogs that I was walking across oh, the okay, road yeah. to. And um, yeah, one of them is not particularly kind of you know crazy adhd kind of dog mm -hmm. <laughs> and this other dog's kind of going towards me i'm like get your dogs together mm -hmm. like not right here like why do you have this leash on and there was no control over it she no. wasn't even holding the little clicker she yeah, was just, just, just hanging belt. that's crazy yeah and like what's she gonna do is she try and grab it and then it's gonna like hurt her hands when she grabs the leash like i think she was not concerned no clearly anything. not <laughs> She was just like, you know, my dogs are fine. They're good, good guys. And it's, it's all fine. Oh my goodness. It brings us to the person. It's like, they're friendly. Like, yeah. <laughs> they're friendly. No. I don't care. <laughs> like, get them away from me. 100%. Not everyone wants to meet your dog. No, definitely not. <laughs> just because your dog is friendly doesn't mean, yeah, you can bother other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what are other tools? Sorry, we are kind of going Again. back. Again. <laughs> So a okay. harness and a longer leash. Harness, there... longer leash. Um, um, treats and toys. Mm -hmm. Whatever your dog is motivated by is what we would be looking for. And and praise, verbal praise and petting is an option. But most dogs are kind of like, yeah, you can pet me, but eh, not really overly seen as a reward for a lot of dogs. Um, so... Uh, food and toys as well mm -hmm. um, something that um, is high value to your dog uh, is a must as well because we are going to be trying to reward those good behaviors and the good choices that our dogs are making around their trigger um, but as well as creating a positive association with that trigger rather than see the trigger I bark lunge trigger moves away see the trigger okay, I turn around and look at my human and I look back at the dog and I look at my human and the dog goes away or I look at the dog and then I sniff down on the ground and just rewarding those behaviors as yeah. well and getting the dog used to behaving in a different way around their trigger. 
because if a dog learns that they can do other things rather than scream, bark, and lunge and kind of spike their stress levels, they're going to do that. Like, it's not fun for them. They're yeah. not trying to be a pain in the butt. They're having a really hard time. Yeah. And the Which only way they know. makes you to have a bad yeah. time as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they just don't know right now of another way to get that dog away mm. or to achieve the result that they want because yeah. that barking and lunging has gotten the thing to move away most likely so they're like well i'm just going to do that because that yeah. gets them to move away the fastest so it's interesting so one of the triggers is kind of like uh, dogs being reactive when there's they're at home or like in the backyard mm-hmm. and there's people walking outside and that's i heard that's quite rewarding for a dog because yes the barking and lunging and the the thing that's making them triggered person or dog Mm -hmm. is moving away from the house Mm -hmm. or backyard and that's kind of a rewarding thing for them yes exactly it reinforces their behavior yes 100 percent. so how would you kind of that's going back but never mind (laughs) how would you say um you would mitigate that Mm -hmm. if you're if there's you know if your dog is inside the house or somewhere where they're safe and they consider it to be their own place Mm -hmm. and they see something outside that's a threat Mm -hmm. and they find it rewarding that this thing is moving away you can't tell that person hey can you like not move no (laughs) can you not walk towards my house and walk by my house (laughs) yeah yell out the door like how do you fix that then 100 percent um so as well as talking about like we said um we're looking to reward and reinforce the alternate behaviors Mm -hmm. We also have to think about kind of it's like another basic rule in dog training that um, practice makes perfect. So the more our dogs practice the behaviors we don't want them to Mm -hmm. do, the better that they're going to get at it. So So consistency. Yes. So consistency and also management. We need to manage their ability to do that barking and lunging or those behaviors that we don't want them to do. So one thing I do suggest, which it's super helpful with like, you could either not allow your dog to have access to like your front windows if they're mm-hmm. inside of the house, um, put your blinds down. It, sometimes that fixes things with some dogs. Some <laughs> just, dogs will bash just gonna through the blinds. We're just going to dog for like a year. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just more of like when you're working on for that small, like that bit amount of time when you're doing the training yeah. to reduce their reinforcement of that barking and lunging mm-hmm. while you're putting reinforcement into those other behaviors. Yeah. So you can kind of move the scales from, oh, I bark and then the person goes away to, ooh, I'm quiet or I look out the window and watch this person walk by and I get cookies for being quiet yeah. and kind of improve that and reinforce that behavior. So the barky lungy goes down yeah. and the reinforced behavior that we want increases. So a little bit of management. So preventing them from doing that barky lungy by putting blinds down or even putting, you can get window films mm-hmm. as well that just kind of um, reduce the visual stimulation for a dog the amount that they can actually see out the window maybe just barricade um, them yeah so and, and yeah that's another <laughs> thing like, like put up a board or something <laughs> or even putting up like a baby gate so your your dog yeah. doesn't have access to that room unless you are there with them and you're like okay we're gonna work on this someone's walking by we're gonna work on we this can put newspaper on <laughs> I mean, that's one way you could do it, it but is, right? um, you could. Like my, yeah. my dog can just read a paper. <laughs> just, if you just read this part of yeah, the article in the paper is really interesting. <laughs> so um, sometimes dog parents actually um, reward bad behaviors unintentionally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I have noticed that, for instance, um, would you say if if a dog is being reactive to something to kind of close them in and physically stop them from jumping? Um, People like, do that sometimes when the dog is being like super reactive towards something and they kind of get their dog crouched down and hold this dog so the dog doesn't... Mm-hmm. And I think that's really dangerous because what if your own dog's going to bite you since since you're the one enclosing them Mm -hmm. kind of putting them in a hog position right yeah yeah and is is that 
the type of behavior that's actually rewarding in some sense because you're given that touch as a reward to your dog it could be like it depends on the the purpose of the behavior why Mm. is the dog is the dog barking and lunging because they feel like they need to protect their human and then they get hugged from the human so maybe it could be rewarding that behavior um like it's very dependent it depends on why the dog is is doing that barking and lunging yeah and as you said it could be a risk to them as well because redirection is a real thing when dogs are super overstimulated they're not necessarily able to decipher the difference between nipping at their human's face and nipping at the trigger that may be coming towards them so it could be a risk for sure if you got down and started bear hugging yeah. your dog to no, get th- them to stay on the a ground real thing um we had a dog that was kind of a ponies husky and a pet bull some type of mix mm-hmm. and um she was extremely reactive to a lot of things and i'm not a dog trainer so i just didn't feel like i was the one qualified to teach this dog what to do and what not to do um so what happened is sometimes the dog parent would come to our door and you know get the dog away from us (laughs) and this dog would uh there would be someone walking just beside a house and this dog would just kind of lunge and bark. And I saw the the dad basically just holding this dog down to stop yeah. lunging. And I'm like, this is not the right way, <laughs> but okay. No, yeah, it's not going to be teaching the dog anything, that's for sure. It, yeah. I guess it would be managing the behavior. So the yeah. dog and then lunging and barking. But, yeah. but that's not really the type of management that we would yeah. want to put in place like, do you want to like go inside the house to maybe get away from this situation you know instead of just holding your dog down like that's not gonna do anything no but i mean but i mean if they're worried if they think like if you th- if they for some reason maybe think that their dog's gonna somehow get it the person i don't yeah. know and if you have to do that to stop okay but yeah but I guess that's something they felt like they had to do in the I don't know scenario, but this, it's not going to fix anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So, um, okay. When would you recommend that people seek professional advice? Um, I think that's very, um, it's very, uh, it's based on the handler, the dog human kind of team. Mm-hmm. Um, really, the sooner the better would be ideal because um as i said the more a dog practices the behavior the better they get at it yeah um, and the more ingrained and the more like it it becomes it it happens more it happens more intensely the more each time the dog rehearses the behavior um so if they're noticing like oh this is odd this is an odd behavior i've never seen before and then if they go and they're put into a similar environment. Let's say you're out on a walk with your dog and then dog comes in the room and all of a sudden your dog's barking and lunging. You're like, that's weird. I've never Mm -hmm. seen that happen before. And then the next day, same thing happens and the dog, your dog barks and lunges again. Like, okay, so it's happening again. If you see at progression that it keeps happening. Yeah. And you're not really sure what to do about it. I probably would seek professional help Um, because the sooner you get the help, the faster you will see that behavior change um, yeah 100 percent, and the easier that behavior change will be if you kind of nip it in the bud a little sooner rather than waiting and waiting and waiting and then it will be harder to change yeah yeah the longer that the dog has practiced that behavior cool. and we want to we want to help our dog as soon as possible too right we don't want them yeah, to be we in want that. them to have a happy yeah. life right mm-hmm. and like we want the walks to be enjoyable exactly you don't want to be stressed out i guess no. your dog can also feel that stress from you 100%. as a person mm-hmm. <laughs> and kind of feed off of it too 100 hey? percent. Yeah. yeah which can make things worse as yeah. well yeah so okay. i feel like we have pretty much covered everything okay <laughs> wonderful <laughs> unless there's anything else that you would like to share you feel like we maybe haven't expanded on something quite fully or um you feel pretty solid <laughs> i think so we went around a lot of things we talked about um yeah we talked about why reactivity can happen um how we can prevent it from happening what we need to work on for working with reactivity um and we covered a lot. Yeah, we did cover <laughs> a lot. I'd say so. We did cover a lot. And 
yeah, I hope that people, I hope that people do reach out because reactivity can be like, as we said, like it's, it can be really stressful for both the dog and the human. Um, and sometimes reaching out to, um, a professional can really ease your stress. Yeah. It really can to know what, what you need to do to help, help you. We help, we help the human, we help the dog. Yeah. Um, it, it, it can really also can help uh, for it to not escalate too, right? Yeah, 100%. To get so stressful. So bad that, that yeah, I just can't take my dog places. And then your dog ends up in shelter or whatever, right? Because yeah. you can't handle it. It's mm-hmm. best if you just reach out to a professional who is able to help you. Yeah, 100%. These um, issues. Yeah, or your or escalates and your dog bites someone. We wanna we wanna yeah. nip it in the bud before that <laughs> stuff starts happening, right? One hundred percent. So for our listeners who want to learn more about you or connect with you, where can they find you online or elsewhere? Okay. Um I am on Facebook and Instagram. I'm not super great at social media, um, but I'm working on it. Um, All right. I, yes. What's your handle? Um, so my Instagram is partner in pause training mm-hmm. and my Facebook is partner in pause training and behavior. Okay. So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. I also have my website, which is partner in pause.com as well. Cool. We're going to um, link it down below. Yes, uh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. So people can contact you if they have a reactive dog, you yep. would be able to help. Them, right yeah, 100% that is my that's my favorite thing to work for work with awesome. my niche yeah 100% <laughs> well thank you so much for coming here today and sharing all your knowledge about reactivity it was very insightful and I appreciate you being here great thank you Magda it was <laughs> lovely thanks for having me a big thank you to our guest Sophie for shedding light on dog reactivity and providing tips for our listeners. If you found today's discussion helpful, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow our Spotify account, or leave us a little like or comment. All right, you guys, until next time. Bye for now. <laughs>